Welcome, dear friends, to the, my presentation with the Educator Collaborative. The name of this workshop session is Poem Motion, Inviting Students to Verse and Music Forms. Welcome to our fall gathering. I'm thrilled that you're here, and I'll guide you through a 35 to 40 minute workshop. Here's a brief description. Uh, the guiding question is, what makes a poem become alive and emotive? And I present that readers do. And those readers are students, teachers, librarians, administrators, family members, all the people who engage with poetry, with verse, and forms of communication. I'll share with you the part of language arts, that's the arts, in varied verse forms and music. I'll also share what I'm calling uh, students as scribes through poetry forms, and there'll also be a sampler of poems to consider for your own students. Uh, here's a brief biographical note. I'm currently an English language arts teacher at an early college high school and affiliated with a local community college to support dual credit and those students who want to pursue higher education through their secondary studies. This is our 20th gathering. I'm an associate with uh, this particular organization, and hopefully you've enjoyed the presentation by Raul III. This is our agenda. I'll guide you through a brief introduction. Also share the ways that we can make the poem come alive and be emotive. Languaging the arts, students as scribes. I'll present some novels in verse and also novels that include music as a form of expression for both the reader and through characters. We'll have two writing opportunities or maybe more. There'll be a sampler of poem motions and I'll share some content and resources for further reading and viewing. And we'll end with some goodwill about poetry and emotions. On the right, we have uh, this year's poster for National Poetry Month. Most of the posters created are by students who love poetry, who are readers of poetry, and also write poetry themselves. I'm drawn to poetry as a poet. I like to write poems with my students, and I also write them on my own and find ways to share my love of poetry with my own students and also with the general public. This is an equation to consider. Uh, a poem plus motion plus emotion equals, well, we'll see. Together, we'll see what that equals. And through all of this, through this workshop and your interest in poetry, always consider your own experience, your students' experiences, and the world that surrounds us. You might be familiar with this wheel of emotions that was presented by a psychologist. And I share this often with students uh, to first to get their ideas, their perspectives on it, but also to find out what they think is missing, which emotions are not present, or maybe that they try to keep inside. And one particular concern that students share is that love is not listed on here, but through literature, through poetry, I show them how it is revealed uh, and many more emotions that are not part of this listing of eight. Asking students what emotions are missing really engages them and also takes another direction from the wheel that there are items missing, particular feelings and emotions. This poem by Naomi Shiab Nye titled The Writer, I believe came first introduces to emotions, but also to think about how we interpret an emotion. Each person has a different interpretation 
but through poetry, we can share that experience in a more concentrated form through verse. The Writer by Naomi Shiab Nye. A boy told me if he roller skated fast enough, his loneliness couldn't catch up to him. The best reason I ever heard for trying to be a champion. What I wonder tonight, pedaling hard down King William Street, is if it translates to bicycles. A victory! To leave your loneliness panting behind you on Sun Street Corner while you float free into a cloud of sudden azaleas, pink petals that have never felt loneliness, no matter how slowly they fell. One writing activity to consider here is asking students how fast they do something, either to finish it for a championship or for practice, and to write on that. And on the right is a quote by Robert Creeley about love coming quietly, finally drops about me, on me, in the old ways. A recent article based on research conducted by Philip Johnson Laird and Keith Oatley is titled How Poetry Evokes Emotions. I found this article about a week ago and I wanted to share it with you, at least the abstract, to help you think about the theories about poetry, uh, methods in poetry, and what we carry with poems, what we bring to poems. I've been working on a book titled Youth Scribes, Teaching a Love of Writing Now. And something that I created is a taxonomy. I believe that there are scribal literacies that students have. Each civilization that we study in many colleges, universities, they always begin with a scribe, someone who enacted a specific literacy in varied forms with varied in varied modes, but those scribes, that scribe fulfilled a significant role in the making of meaning with interpretation, with translation. And I created what I'm calling a, a scribal taxonomy of the elements of literacy. It begins with uh, the letter K and the belief that every student is a scribe who can enact the elements of literacy with interest, joy, love, and wonder, while guided by teachers towards scribal inquiry in the literacy journey. And some of these elements include knowing, listening, memorizing, noticing, observing, performing, questioning, reading, speaking, thinking, understanding, viewing, and writing. And on the left is an example of a scribe, a tlacuilo, in a Mexican society and Aztec society. And this is from the 1500s. Comics often reveal specific emotions, a certain appeal to rhetoric and our life. If we look at a more recent a uh, comic by Lalo Alcaraz on the left, upper left. Here we have an alien uh, making a journey and his response is nope. He is going to avoid our planet Earth. That alien will avoid us. On the lower left, this is from last year. Uh, the question here is, why are you leaving? Too hot, rent too high. And on the right, these are the things that you can win in the Loteria of Life, the Lottery of Life, if you get vaccinated against COVID-19. Love, food, health, parties, fiestas, and ultimately travel. We'll begin with a poem next by Jose Garcia Villa. This poem will be read 
by Nicolo Ludovis. First, a poem must be magical, then musical as a seagull. It must be a brightness moving and hold secret a bird's flowering. It must be slender as a bell and it must hold fire as well. It must have the wisdom of bows and it must kneel like a rose. It must be able to hear the luminance of dove and deer. It must be able to hide what it seeks like a bride. And overall, I would like to hover God smiling from the poem's cover. First, A Poem Must Be Magical by Jose Garcia Villa. Well, in this poem by Garcia Villa, think about the senses, uh, how significant they are in their description to this poem, lyrics too. Uh, this poem first appeared in 1941, and my students respond uh, in a very interactive way to this poem by identifying the senses, the five senses, or six or more, and they're able to describe how it works in the poem, what makes the poem come to life. Uh, this next poem includes a description, the background for the writing of the poem, and also a paper mache puppetry presentation. Gwendolyn Brooks is a celebrated poet uh, born in Kansas and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Um, her work is quite inspiring for all of my students. When I was a high school student, I wrote to Gwendolyn Brooks asking her if she'd be my poet friend, and we kept correspondence. Her love of young people, their interest in verse, or their aversion to verse, uh, drew Brooks into their lives. And she funded many, many awards, prizes for young people in Illinois and across the country to promote poetry at a time before social media, and other forms of communication. I'll play the recording, which is quite significant because it lends a lot from the poet's point of view, the creation of verse, and how a poem survives across time. Note the music, the musicality. Thank you. I guess I'd better offer you. We real cool. Most young people know me only by that. Thank you. That I dislike it, but I would prefer it if the textbook compilers and the anthologists would assume that I've written a few other poems. Mm -hmm. Thank 
I wrote it because I was passing by a pool hall in my community one afternoon during school time, and I saw therein a uh, little bunch of boys, I say here in this poem seven, and they were shooting. Instead of asking myself, why aren't they in school? I asked myself, I wonder how they feel about themselves. The pool players, seven, the golden shovel. In this particular uh, poem, uh, I think a significant question is posed to the reader about emotions uh, by Gwendolyn Brooks. And she asks, I wonder how they're feeling. And that's a significant question for my students when they hear her ask this. And several times students express how she is suspending judgment, uh, being judgment free as a writer, as a poet, trying to find out trying to discern something, beginning with a question. Uh, but those feelings they note that appear in the poem and how they translate to everyday life and their own lives, uh, setting the poem also in context in the year it was published and how it resonates with young people. Um, all of those conversations happen in the classroom and outside as well. So let's write. What are you noting about music in poetry? How does it how does a poem come alive? And how can these poems resonate with your own students? And you can pause at this time the video and then we can proceed. This next poem is by Nikki Giovanni. And the title of this poem is Kidnap Poem.
ever been kidnapped by a poet? If I were a poet, I'd kidnap you, put you in my phrases and meter you to Jones Beach, or maybe Coney Island, or maybe just to my house. Lyric you in lilacs, dash you in the rain, blend into the beach to compliment my sea, play the lyre for you, old you with my love song, anything to win you, wrap you in the red, black, green, show you off to mama, yeah. If I were a poet, I'd kidnap you. Uh, Nikki Giovanni's poem takes several directions and also the voice in the poem is guiding us through possibly a city, uh, specific places in a city. And I have students map the areas that they visit. How do they feel? What do they notice? What are they observing? And paying attention also to the breaks that the poet has in the poem, the voice in the poem, the speaker in the poem, and how does it end? Do they feel kidnapped? Notice the break between kid and nap. The poem Oranges from 1983 was written by Gary Soto and it features about three different modes of delivery. Uh, one of them is a musical composition. The second one is a short film. The third could be reading the initial publication from June 1983 from Poetry, the journal. And students also create their own digital videos based on a scene, a line, or the complete poem by Gary Soto. This poem by Pat Moore is quite famous. It's titled Immigrants. The title of the poem uh, joins line one. Immigrants wrap their babies in the American flag, feed them mashed hot dogs and apple pie, name them Bill and Daisy, buy them blonde dolls that blink blue eyes, or a football and tiny cleats before the baby can even walk. Speak to them in thick English. Hello, baby, hello. Whisper in Spanish or Polish when the babies sleep. Whisper in a dark parent bed, that dark parent fear. Will they like our boy, our girl, our fine American boy, our fine American girl? Students practice memorization with this poem. Also, the multiple sounds that appear uh, from different places, uh, whether from sports to doll play to the long I sounds, alliteration, assonance. We examine this poem to find the music, the sounds uh, read by a classmate, by the poet herself uh, after they've heard her recording. And a third piece could be students recording themselves, reading it in performance. In this poem, It Is Going to Rain, Ophelia Cepeda presents her multilingualism and also her native language, the indigenous people of Arizona and Sonora, Mexico. And she shares this poem of the Ottoman language and people. It is not so, because I have not yet felt the sky become heavy with the moisture of preparation. I think it is not so, because I have not yet felt the winds move with their coolness. I think it is not so, because I have not yet inhaled the sweet, wet dirt the winds bring. So, there is no truth that it will rain. 
This poem, It's Going to Rain, is of course a, a bilingual piece. It's written in the Autumn language. Um, the Autumn language is my first language. Um, a language, of course, that came from um, my family. Um, it was the only language uh, of the home as I grew up and so uh, was used uh, regularly and uh, I grew up uh, speaking the language and then learning English uh, after going to school. The Autumn language is spoken here in Southern Arizona and also in Northern Sonora, Mexico, uh, this whole area, uh, which are of course the traditional lands of uh, the Autumn. Um, there are many Autumn speakers still, uh, however, like many other languages, it is an endangered language. Um, and um, that is based on the fact that we have mostly adult speakers and very few uh, children who are learning the home, excuse me, the language in a natural setting. Um, anyway, and a little bit about the, the poem itself. Um, when I first started writing, uh, the first pieces I wrote were in Autumn, uh, and that was primarily for my students who were learning how to read uh, Autumn. We produced uh, small amounts of um, writing, uh, creative writing, uh, poems uh, in the language so that we could have something to read in the classroom as we were becoming literate or I was teaching them um, how to read and write uh, the language. Um, so I feel very comfortable, you know, writing in autumn. And then of course, eventually I uh, moved into English and now um, I will write, you know, either in autumn and English or else. To so the background on this poem is helpful to readers, to my students, and also to understand the multilingualism of the United States. To hear the poet speak about the writing of her poem, her first language, these are all experiences relevant in the making of poems and the musicality in a poem. This is a poem by Ryan G. Van Cleve, Body Music. The tummy rumbles, my knees go pop. Are my toes cracking as I skip and hop? I sniffle, I snort, I laugh, I snore. One time my belch opened a door. My neck, it creaks. My nose, it whistles. My butt makes a boom like exploding missiles. I'm a walking chorus. This is my shtick. Sit back and enjoy my body music. These are three examples of novels in verse, or I'm sorry, two examples, although there's several by these authors, Jacqueline Woodson and Jason Reynolds. This particular novel by Erica L. Sanchez features a famous song of Latin America, and the name of that song is Todo Cambia by the songwriter artist celebrated singer Mercedes Sosa. The character Julia in the novel by Erica Sanchez explains Todo Cambia by Mercedes Sosa. I became obsessed the first time I heard it. Everything in the sound is true. Everything changes for better or worse, whether we like it or not. Sometimes it's beautiful and sometimes it fills us with terror, sometimes both. And these links uh, you can use with your students uh, later to hear the song and make connections between verse and um, music. This is a recommended novel series by Charlton Trujillo, who incorporates music, in this case, rock and roll, in the third installment in the series. This is a recent poem that I wrote and it was published where the stars meet people, uh, edited uh, by Leela Petrie. If you happen to see a heart in this poem, then listen to the beating half in yours too, okay? 
think about a concrete poem or a shape poem. Write your own. Think about a shape you see often, or maybe a shape that's near you right now by your desk, where you're sitting, an image or an image in your phone. Create a shape or concrete poem from that image. A sampler of poem motions appear here, uh, ranging from Tupac Shakur's work to Julian Randall, Sandra Cisneros, Gwendolyn Brooks's reading of her poem, The Lovers of the Poor, to poems for teens on specific themes and topics in their adolescent life and as they come of age. And additional works uh, that I recommend are by poets who uh, embrace us, embrace our students, a love of words and verse and music. Uh, they're listed here uh, as recommendations and also to introduce to your students. Although many students have met uh, most of these poets and the conversations, the poems can always be springboards to more music in verse. Uh, these are recommended books for both teachers and students uh, to advance uh, music in verse and to make sure that students receive that invitation to write poetry. Well, I wish you lots of goodwill in the making of poems and with your students. Uh, continue to enlighten students with poetry, make it inviting, and share with them the world of poetry across eras, ages, genres, and embed music that appeals to them. Thank you.